Hi, my name is Mick Keeper. I'm a professor of counselling psychology at the University of Roehampton. And I'm going to be doing a session on using measures uh, in therapeutic work with children and young people. So we'll be talking about both process measures and outcome measures. Um, now, just to say to begin with, there is a really fantastic resource for all things on outcome measures, young people's voices on it and their perspectives, uh, lots of different tools. And it's the uh, Cork Outcome uh, Child Outcome Research Consortium site, Court UK Net. Uh, a number of the things I'm going to be talking about, most of what I'm going to talk about is accessible there. So do go and have a look at it and have a good look around, lots of videos, and you can find out lots more about um, outcome measurement with uh, young people and children and lots of resources. Just to say a bit of the background, really. Uh, what we've seen in recent years is that there's been a really dramatic increase in the use of uh, outcome measures for children and young people. Uh, and in a lot of services, CAM services, a lot of school counselling services, is now absolutely integral to practice. And it, it, it's, a, it's built into practice. And sometimes people will be using outcome measures. Uh, young people will be using them perhaps every week or at review points and most likely at assessment and outcome points to some extent at least. And what I'm going to be doing in this session, this lecture, and there's some exercises to go with it, is introducing you to the use of process and outcome measures in counselling with children and young people, some of the discussions about it, and also kind of hands-on uh, what tools are out there and what their strengths and limitations are. So some of the learning outcomes of the workshop is, by the end of it, what I hope is that you'll understand the advantages and disadvantages of using process and outcome measures in counselling with children and young people. Uh, you'll be able to identify the principal outcome and process measures that are used here in England and the UK. Uh, Recognise the basic principles of using outcome and process measures, so how you should be using them. And uh, something about also how to analyse and interpret data, just very briefly, on how to make sense of the outcomes. And then importantly, finding further sources for uh, information and support. So the first thing that I'd like you to do, and if you want to just pause the video here, because I won't leave a long pause of 15 minutes, but if you want to do it with pauses... Uh, if you're using this in a teaching session, then take maybe five, ten minutes or so in a, in a group or with a partner just to think about how do you feel about using measures in uh, therapy with children and young people. What do you see as their advantages and what do you see as their disadvantages? And if you'd like to pause me now... <laughs> OK, and this is me starting again. So... Just to say something about why sometimes, and I think for very good reason why people in the counselling field can be very wary of using measures. I guess, first of all, there's concerns that what are measures really measuring? That it's all a bit kind of empty, it's a bit meaningless, it's symptoms, it's, but it's not the kind of rich complexity of what young people come to counselling with, children and young people. It, it can't really articulate that in a few lines, a few written lines. And of course... It might only be suitable for kids who are maybe better able to express themselves verbally. And for children who can't, uh, you might feel that it really can't say much about what's going on for them at all. I think another concern for uh, practitioners is that if you're filling in forms and measures and doing lots of uh, instruments, then it can take time away from uh, the deeper therapeutic work and, and you know really having a dialogue and, and engaging with a child and young person. I guess a lot of people, and just to say, I'm from a humanistic person-centered background, but I know a lot of people worry that it's kind of dehumanizing, that it turns this rich relationship into something about numbers, and it becomes a kind of object that you score and you rate, rather than perhaps an experience and a process of being with someone in a deeper relationship. There's something about measures that... If you've got, let's say, a measure of depression or a measure of anxiety, it's kind of implying that that's what the therapeutic work should be about. It should be about moving positively towards less distress or more well-being, but it kind of predefines it rather than letting the child, the young person or the practitioner um, define what, the, what it is that they want to change. And kind of related to that, it's, it's just this sense that it makes therapy about kind of doing and objectives and goals and getting somewhere, 
rather than perhaps something um, which is more about being and being with us. Sorry, just checking my phone is off. That's very rude. So, you know, those are some of the reasons why I think quite rightly people are wary of, of using outcome measures and feedback. But there's also a number of strengths. And uh, particularly strengths from the young person's perspective. So I, I, when I started seeing this growth in measures and, and I was pretty wary myself. But I think what changed my mind was listening to the voice of adults or children and young people. I, I work mainly with adults, although most of my research was with children and young people. And just hearing from them, really, what they saw as the value of it and realising that they were actually often more positive about it than I was and other practitioners can be. I guess one of the first things is that young people can feel and children that a measure, say it's asking a question like, uh, I haven't been sleeping well, it can help them kind of express that. They might kind of be aware of that, but not really be knowing how to articulate it. And by being able to say, yeah, actually, that's the issue that's going on with me, that that can be quite useful for them in thinking about what's going on. Some of the process measures are about inviting young people to talk about how they feel about the relationship and you know, that's something else that particularly they might find difficult to talk about. And say you've got a feedback tool like the uh, child session rating scale that we'll come back to, which asks the child things like, um, did you feel that the therapist listened to you or didn't listen to you? Well, that gives a child an opportunity to express something uh, that not just is hard to articulate for themselves, but they also might feel a bit shy about saying about, oh, I didn't feel that listened to. So it can kind of give children a voice. And I think that's where it can be useful. Uh, and also a sense that their views are important. Um, <clears throat> I think uh, people often feel that with outcome measures and process measures, that it's kind of asking them what do they think and giving them an opportunity to say how it is for them. So the second thing is that there's a lot of debate about this, but certainly in the adult field, there's good research that clients do get more out of therapy uh, when there's a kind of tracking of outcomes because it helps practitioners know when things aren't going so well. Therapists, we like to think that we've got a good intuitive sense of how progress is going, but actually we can be over-optimistic. Research shows that we can be over-optimistic. Say a client is getting worse. Uh, we might think, well, they need to get worse before they get better. But actually what the research shows is that if people tend to get worse, they do often actually drop out and... Uh, and if we've got a system, if we're, if we're tracking outcomes, we can be more aware of that. And then research shown that by being more aware of that, we can then do something about that, maybe focus on the relationship, talk to the client about how things are going. And that can help move things forward. So intuition is a wonderful thing, but it's not always right. Uh, and sometimes um, uh, using something outside of ourselves rather than just relying on intuition can be helpful. It's not either or, of course both have their place um in work with children and young people we've done some work around that and we've <clears throat> we, we we did some work with bernardo's looking at outcomes uh where they we use feedback measures and they were very good outcomes and they, 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 the 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 evidence is a bit more mixed about whether uh outcome measures enhance outcomes with children and young people but it's kind of promising and it certainly doesn't seem to uh detract from outcomes Oh, there's a, sorry, I keep on going back and forth. That's the study with Bernardo's uh, school-based counselling using systematic feedback, where we got some really good outcomes uh, using the systematic feedback measures. Now, I, I guess for me, the most convincing thing probably is that actually clients do seem to like using measures. I mean, not all clients. Uh, this is like adult ratings of client uh, feedback forms. And um, we've got things here like the goals form, which is similar to the goal-based outcome tool I'll talk about. A little bit later uh, and you can see that with all these forms interestingly apart from the alliance forms uh, you might not know these forms and this is for adults but adults kind of say that they like the forms and and and, and young people and children uh, often say that too that the forms uh, are helpful and we'll come on to why that is one of one of the reasons I guess is what young people say is that the forms can help them focus on what it is that they want to change. That if, for instance, they're um, identifying that they're not sleeping well or that they're um, feeling low, then it can make them think, okay, this is something that I want to work on. So it kind of gives goals, kind of gives a focus, which can be helpful for clients. 
And then also kind of how much change that they're making. And one of the things that a lot of clients like about feedback forms uh, is that they can see that they're getting better. Sometimes a client will come in and go, oh, I don't feel like anything's changing. If you're using some kind of system of outcome measurement and you can actually say, well, interestingly, your depression score, for instance, is seven and it was 13 when you started counseling, that clients can find that really reassuring. And Generally, clients like to uh, do like to see that. As I was saying before, there's something also about kind of it can help clients articulate and find the words uh, for how they feel. One client was saying, uh, the counsellor, I mean, this was a, a study I did almost 20 years ago now when I started researching counselling with young people. And one client was basically saying their favourite bit of the counselling was filling in the uh, call form at the beginning. They said, the counsellor gave me a question over how I was feeling today. And that just made me think about what I was actually like feeling. Uh, so, and sometimes it's kind of easier to write that down, um, rather than perhaps, um, uh, you know, if you put things down in words, it gives a kind of shape and a form to it and it helps with that process of, uh, insight, uh, so that young people can find that valuable. It's kind of, if you know art therapies, there's this idea of the third space that the art acts as a third space. And I think sometimes young people use measures or children use measures as a kind of third space to express things and to communicate in a way with the with the therapist and of course there's a criticism there that well you know they're not always objective and of course they're not objective of course they're not objective they're not saying some kind of truth and and it's always interpreted through the young person's wants and desires maybe they want to give the counselor a kind of good mark so they say that things are feeling about there. So these things can always have an influence, but at the same time, it's a means of communication. In the same, I mean, art's not objective. If a child does a drawing in a session, it's not objective, but it, it's a way of expressing something, and I think measures can serve the same function. As therapists, importantly, we can use the data that we're getting from clients to in, adjust, improve our approach. Um, if if our results, for want of a better word, aren't very good, then 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 it's something that yeah we should be looking at. Um, and generally, the encouraging thing is that when we have use outcome measures, we see that clients are actually doing very well. Uh, many of our clients, and it can be very reassuring. But if that's not the case, then I, I guess you know rather than just saying where well, everything's fine, it does invite us. It gives us that opportunity to look at it and think about what we might be doing differently. And also, I think very importantly, for a service, it provides evidence for a service. So we can use outcome measures on an individual level to track individual outcomes for a client. But we can also use them at service level to look at outcomes across services. Now, we've done evaluations, say, of uh, school counselling services, person-centred school counselling, uh, and we showed that it was really strongly associated with positive change, that there were some really good outcomes uh, associated with that intervention. And, and when I was up in Glasgow, we'd be using that data as a way of going back to the funders and saying, look, this, this seems to be associated with positive change. And it was really positive change. Uh, we did something similar with the voluntary and uh, community sector councillors, Youth Access, recently, a paper on the outcomes there showing again that there was some really positive change taking place. We live in a world now where funders want to see evidence and that, that's not going to change. They're not going to start thinking, oh, well, actually, I, you know, I, I can do without it. I, well, they might do, but I think it's very unlikely. I think, if anything, it's going to get tougher. Um, and I think, in a way, as therapists, there's some onus on us to uh, to, to evidence what we do. That, that There's something maybe a bit, what's the word, narcissistic, maybe to think that just by saying, I think this is going to work, everybody else is going to go, yeah, yeah, absolutely right. I mean, you know, people tell me things work all the time, facial creams or... Uh, <coughs> sorry, nobody tells me facial creams work, but you know what I mean, or, or kind of Scientology. You know, people always say things work, and I don't always believe them, so why should people always believe me when I say something works? I think there's an onus to use some kind of common language like research evidence as a way of proving something. <coughs> The reality is that if we don't kind of gather evidence on our approaches that, and we've seen this in nice guidelines and we, we, we the, the, the policy makers, the government, as I was saying, not just at a local level, but at a national level, are increasingly only funding those services where there's evidence for. 
uh, and we can say, well, it's against our principles to generate evidence. But I, as well as kind of not feeling very kind of person-centered, if we want to put it away, because it doesn't feel very dialogic, I also think that it can be a good thing for us to look at our evidence and and if it's not showing good effects, then we can learn from that. And if it does show good effects, that's great. And probably we can learn about how to improve what we do uh, through drawing on evidence. So I, I think there's good arguments there. In terms of measures, there's, so, so to start thinking more about concretely measures, there's, there's a number of different ways in which these dif measures differ. Um, first one is that some measures are free, some measures you have to pay for or have contracts. The good news is most of the measures and most of the ones I'm going to talk about are free measures. And there's some really good ones. Some of the best ones now are freely available. So cost isn't so much of an issue. Uh, even uh, kind of, well, sometimes I guess completing digitally, if you want to use a digital system, you have to pay for that. But paper copies, being able to print out them on the best measures are pretty much all free. You get short measures, you get longer measures. Uh, shorter measures are maybe, the shorts tend to be about four, maybe ten items. Obviously, they're more useful, and particularly if you're measuring every week. Uh, longer measures, something like the SDQ, which is, what is it, 28 items, I think. That's right, I should know that. Um, you're less likely to use every week. Uh, longer measures have a bit more reliability, but shorter measures can be very reliable, and there's kind of a move towards... Uh, shorter measures just to say actually I mean there is an emphasis on measuring outcomes every week and in CAM services it tends to be maybe the first couple of minutes you'd ask a young person to do a form uh, at the beginning of a session sometimes also at the end the reason for that is that because you get dropout if you don't do measures every week it's very difficult to know um, uh, uh, kind of the, the overall how much change you're seeing as a service because if you're not getting the you know if you just do the beginning and the end by the end you can expect maybe 30 percent 50 percent of the kids are dropped out so if you're just doing the beginning and the end you don't know how much change happened for the kids who dropped out and you're probably going to end up overestimating how much change there is so if you do the measures every week uh, it means that you've always got a last measure for everyone. If they drop out, you've still got a last measure for them. And also, as, as I was saying before, it's a way of kind of tracking outcomes, seeing how things are going, and then working on issues that might come up. And there's various systems and, and ways to do that. Most of the measures I'm going to talk about are self-completed for young people. But under the age of 11 or so, you're also looking at more parent-completed or teacher-completed measures uh, to, to, to get a sense of where the where the child is up to. Young people, you've got those measures as well, but there's more of an emphasis on self-completing measures. So some of the measures tend to be for the older group, some for the younger group. There's not that many that actually span kind of five to 18, unless they're parent rated, but the self-completed ones, because just the needs are so different often, uh, they tend to either be for the younger group or the older group, and I'll talk about that. Something to bear in mind is that, you know, you look at these measures and you think, oh my God, somebody just, how did they come up with that question? It was just on the back of an envelope, uh, back of a cigarette packet. But, you know, measures take forever to uh, to develop. You know, these are re we, we developed one on relational depth a few years ago, and it was maybe five, six years <laughs> for six questions. I mean, it was like a year a question. You have to do so much work because you have to show that the measures are related, but not too related. You have to show that the measure correlates with other measures. Ideally, you set benchmarks for clinical, non-clinical norms. Um, and the measures I'm going to talk to you about today are all well validated. And it's fairly easy to find out if a measure is well validated or not. Um, you can look on Google Scholar, for instance, and if there's papers on it, that's a, that's a good sign. One of the implications of that is that I would really caution people against developing their own measures. I know a lot of services think, well, I don't quite like core, so I'll ask slightly different questions, or, um, well, there are these specific things I want to know about. Sometimes that's okay, but if you want, particularly if you want to be able to have evidence that you can take to funders, using a measure that has been really well validated, that's just out there, off the shelf, it's generally a better idea than trying to uh, create something yourself just because of the amount of work that needs to go into these things. You've also got measures that can be used on digital systems and a lot of outcome monitoring now is using digital systems like Pragmatic Tracker 
<laughs> I said that very slow. Bit of a shout out to Pragmatic Tracker because they're a really good uh, system for data monitoring uh, because they've been developed by counselors and psychotherapists themselves and uh, they're really nice guys to work with. But there's lots of other systems that are out there that you can use. A survey is less likely you'll, you'll use this on an individual level. But if you're working on a service, they might have some kind of digital capture system. Um, uh, but you can also use paper copies. And in terms of the young people's experience, probably doesn't make much difference. Uh, and they're both fairly easy to use uh, in different ways. Having said those dimensions, there's two main families of measures that I'm going to talk about. So the first is outcome measures, and those are measures that look at the child or young person's level of distress, difficulties, well-being, kind of their psychological state at a particular point in time, their, their psychological outcomes. could be child completed, it could be parent completed or teacher completed, but they're a kind of indication of psychological distress or well-being, or, but, but outside of therapy, like in their lives. And then you have the process measures, and there's less of these, but I think they're quite interesting, and I'll talk a bit about the main one. And these look at the what's going on in the relationship. Uh, so they're not kind of things outside of the relationship. You've got the kind of extra therapeutic measures, which is the outcome measures, and then you've got things about what happens in therapy, which are the process measures. So let's start by looking at the outcome measures. Um, and again, here, there's a number of different types. So firstly, and most generally, you've got some kind of general distress measures. So you've got things like the young person's core, uh, the strengths and difficulties questionnaire, and also what's called the uh, child outcome rating scale. Those are probably three of the most widely used ones. These are kind of general measures of how well somebody is doing. Um, that's not tied to any particular depression or anxiety or eating disorder. It's kind of general measure. And and for services where you're doing counselling service, that's often the best thing to have because if you you don't want to have too many measures. And if you have uh, just one, then having something general makes more sense than having just depression or anxiety. But if you're, for instance, a substance abuse clinic, then that might not be uh, so relevant. Then you've got disorder-specific measures like the reviled, 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 sorry, not reviled, revised child anxiety and depression scale, which looks specifically at depression and then some anxiety disorder. And there's thousands of those measures. Um, looking at a whole range of problems, eating disorders, uh, substance use, uh, um, um, yeah, anything you can think of really, there's probably a measure out there and you can you can Google, you can search those in the Cork site, it's very good for that. Then you've got well-being measures, which is which is focused on uh, kind of positive well-being. So the most best known one there is the very snappily titled WEMWOBS, which is the Warwick and Edinburgh, Warwick and Edinburgh, a it's, uh, yeah, Warwick and Edinburgh Mental Wellbeing <laughs> Scale. I should be able to say that by now. Uh, um, yeah, and but there's other ones, like there's the Authenticity Scale, like a person-centred uh, counselling organisation might be interested in using uh, uh, the Authenticity Scale. Then you've got uh, an interesting set of measures, and I'll talk particularly about the goal-based outcome tools, which is where it's ideographic. Now, what that means is it's tailored to the individual client rather than being a standardised measure. All the other ones are what you call nomothetic. They're standardised, same items. But ideographic measures, you set up particular items. take longer, but you t set up particular items for that young person. And those have, I think, clinical benefits as well and then you have satisfaction measures and the main one there is the experience of service questionnaire which is um, looks at how somebody experienced the service it's kind of that's kind of halfway between an outcome and a process measure in some ways it's probably closer to a process measure really um so what are the most popular measures in the uk that are free relatively easy to use and have good psychometric properties i'm, I'm gonna <laughs> i'm gonna be able to tell you that that's that's the task yeah what i'd like you to do then is again if you're doing this as a as a workshop so you should have copies of the sdq the young person's core the cores and the arcads there and what i'd like you to do is to 
imagine yourself as a young person and just if you're doing this on your own if you're not doing this in class if you're doing this on your own just make sure that you've got some support around you because uh, obviously it can trigger uh, difficult feelings so make sure you've got some support and obviously don't do this if you don't want to uh, and look after yourself but if you're okay to do it then uh, complete those four measures but do it as a young person so not not as you are now imagine yourself back maybe in the 12 or 13 and have a go at filling those in and just think about, you know, what, 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 how it feels as a young person to do those forms. If you don't want to do that, you could just do it for now. But as I say, just look after yourself and, uh, uh, and, and take care, particularly if there's more traumatic things back there that wouldn't make sense to go into at this point. And when you've done that, uh, that, that will probably take maybe five, ten minutes to do on your own. And then discuss with a partner uh, what you see is the kind of strength, what you like, what you didn't like about each of those measures. And then if you're in a group, uh, you might want to do that in partners and then spend a bit of time as a group uh, just sharing that with each other. Okay, I hope that's clear and you can pause me now. Okay. I hope that was interesting. So strengths and difficulties questionnaire is one of the most widely used measures in the UK, developed by Robert Goodman and colleagues in the 90s now, late 90s. Um, it assesses kind of general difficulties, general psychological difficulties. Probably the most widely used measure across counselling, CAM services, um, voluntary sector. Uh, probably more widely used with children than with young people. Uh, I know when we used it in Glasgow, some of the young people found the language a little bit too maybe patronising. They, they felt it was it was a little bit young for them. Um, but it's a very well respected measure. It's, 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 a, it's a really strong measure and it's very good because you can compare. It's used nationally as well, so you can compare against national uh, benchmarks. Covers all the children and young people age range. It goes from about Four, I think, or five to eighteen, and there's parent and teacher versions for different age range. So it's really helpful if you're working with particular. I mean, if you're working with kids, younger kids, this is under eleven. You probably are going to use this one in a counselling service because uh, place to be. I know, for instance, have used it for ages um, because it's very reliable, very easy to benchmark. Um, lots of translations, which is a real strength. So that if you're working with clients who maybe English isn't their first language, uh, you can go to the SDQ Info website. Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, the SDQ Info website. And if you just search SDQ or SDQ Info, you'll find the website and there's lots of good details there. Um, and they have all the translations, which is fantastic. And you can download that. Just to say also that the... What you have with the SDQ is you have a total difficulty score. It's nice, actually. Well, it's also nice. It has, a, it has kind of strength. It has five, five subscales. And one of them is a strength. So it looks at strengths as well as difficult. It's a little bit, but, uh, you know, it's good that it looks at strengths, I think. And then it has four subscales that together form the total difficulty scale. And that's the main thing that most people use is the total difficulty scale. You can break it down also into the four subscales, which, if I, can, if I can remember, are emotional symptoms, which is probably most relevant to counselling, peer problems, uh, hyperactivity, and conduct problems, well, I remember that. Um, and you can look at those individually, but you have to be a bit cautious because the reliability of those subscales is, is, is a little bit more marginal. Um, and and so really you, you mainly want to look at type of difficulty it's also got um, benchmarks for kind of higher levels of distress so you can and because it's been used so widely you can kind of look at where young people might sit or children in terms of very high levels of distress and you can then look at whether there's change in movement across a counselling service so that's really helpful in terms of that measure now, this is one that I've been involved in, which is also a measure of general distress, but tends to be a bit more for young people. It's the young person's core based on the core family measures, which was developed for adult. Really nice uh, measure. Very uh, young people seem to like it. Again, like the SDQ, it's free. I think with the SDQ, you have to pay if you use their site for entering data. But the young person's core from the core systems trust is completely free. Um, and, uh, and just to say, but with all these measures, they're free, but uh, you, you mustn't change them because, uh, you know, if you start kind of adding, oh, I, I think I'll add an item, we'll take that one away. 
really don't do that because it, it, it messes everything up and um, uh, yeah and it, it means that the results aren't, aren't, aren't valid in the same way but we've this is probably the one that's most used across counseling services in the UK again kind of general distress psychological distress it's for 11 year old and up um, to 16 it's been validated for there's a couple of strong by Elspeth Twig uh, you can look up uh, validating papers, validating the language is a bit less clinical than the SDQ, which I guess is a strength if you're using it in counselling services, right? Maybe rather than CAMs and schools, and um, and it tends to young people tend to slightly prefer it, I think, but not not all. Um, yeah, and because it's a bit shorter than the SDQ, and also the time frame. Actually, I should have said in terms of dimensions. The time frames can change. So some of them, like the SDQ, asks how have you been over the last six months and then the follow-up is over the last month. So it's very good for screening and it gives a bit more kind of stability. But in terms of if you're looking, for instance, a week-to-week -week change, the young person's core that asks you over the last week uh, makes more sense to monitor week-to-week -week change. Now, the Child Outcome Rating Scale, I think you need to uh, have a contract to use. It's not too expensive, but if you look that one up, uh, there, there's a there's a contract for it. This is the and there's there's, there's a adult version and then a child version, which is here. Uh, yeah, so that's the child outcome rating scale, which is pretty similar to the outcome rating scale. And if if, if they're over kind of 13, 14, you might want to use the adult version. Uh, if if kids might find the smiley faces a little bit too juvenile, um, it's very brief. Uh, young people and children tend to like these maybe more than the other ones just because they can quickly tick it off. And what happens is the young person just makes a mark and then what that the the problem is, if you like, the um, counsellor or the therapist then has to get a ruler and you have to be very careful how you print this off so the lines are exactly 10 centimetres. And then the uh, therapist gets a ruler and kind of measures it from zero to ten and says, "Okay, we got nine point two here." So, uh, kids, I think, can quite enjoy that. <laughs> Seeing you work a bit, and uh, and then you do a total scale, and then you can talk about that with them, and that that can be part of the kind of therapeutic process. I mean, with all these measures, good practices, I'll come on to is that you integrate. You don't just give it to someone and just say, "Right, okay, here, do it." Uh, you integrate it into the work, and you talk about it, and. Uh, I think particularly with this one, it can be a, an interesting one to do. Yeah, it requires a ruler. So the RCAD is more um, symptom-based and, and I guess maybe more suited to CAMs in that sense than uh, counselling services. But it looks, uh, it, has, it has a couple of, it has a few subscales, one depression subscale and then different anxiety disorder subscale. So things like um, I worry about things is on the anxiety scale. Feel sad and empty is on the depression scale. It's very well validated and very helpful if you're looking at particular psychological problems. Now, this is, as I was saying, that there's also ideographic measures, and this is something quite different, which is this is the goal based outcome tool. And the way this works is that the young person or their parents and carers are invited to um, establish three goals. If you're using it with parents and carers, then you might all work together to set some goals or you might set goals separately with the parents and then young pe pe people and so you would agree some goals at the beginning of therapy which in itself can be a therapeutic process just working out what it is that you want to achieve and then you would write the goals down and then you can track the process on each so you'd have these goal progress charts each individual one and you would then track progress over the course of therapy in terms of where the young person in, is on the goal. Developed by Duncan Law, clinical psychologist. He's worked very much with young people in CAMS. I think it's a very um, child-friendly system. And Duncan's really, and colleagues like Jenna Jacobs have worked really hard to, um, to, to make it a system that's empowering. Uh, because here what you've got is a young person deciding for themselves what it is that they want to work on psychometrically we've done quite a lot of research on it and it seems pretty sound relates to other uh psych psych, psych uh, outcome measures but also picks up different kinds of changes and generally actually you see more change on um these individualized measures than you do on uh the more nomothetic standardized measures so just as an exercise what i want to suggest is that 
we have a look at a video about completing the goal-based outcome tool. And then what I'd like you to do is once you watch the video, talk to a partner about how you think this compares with using uh, the non-individualized, the normothetic measures. So the video is here um, and it's a training video. There's quite a few training videos from Duncan and it's uh, using goals in psychological therapy with a teenage girl with eating disorders. And there's a lot of videos there that you can look at. Now I'm gonna see if I can do this. Uh, and apologies if I don't get this right. Let's see if we can watch this video together. Having had a discussion with Joe's parents, we joined the session as Joe and the practitioner spent some time talking alone, giving Joe the opportunity to say more without her parents there. So, Joe, so, Joe um, we've just met with your mum and dad and you, and we've heard a bit from all of you about uh, what's going well, and also uh, mum and dad had quite a lot of worries, and we heard quite a lot from you as well about how you saw things uh, and we said that it would be helpful to meet with you on your own without mum and dad around just because sometimes it's just easy to talk about things without mums and dads being there so we've got about 15 minutes or so to have a chance for you to say whatever it is you want to talk about with mum and dad not being here to help me understand something a bit more about uh, what's brought you along here today I told you everything already, though. It's just I'm having some like I find peeing like difficult. When like when people look at you, they seem to judge you, and you're peeing again. It's all short, and I just want to cover up. And when I get home, my mum and dad always force me to eat all this food, and I I don't want to eat it. I feel fat already. Why I can't? Why do they make me eat it? Just, just. And you were saying a bit about that earlier, weren't you? That that's the bit that really bothers you about mum and dad sort of making you eat when you really don't want to. Yeah. Yeah. Force me. Just, yeah. Mm. Mm. What? And they, they said quite a lot about what they would like to be different. They were saying that they were really worried about your eating. And... You and were you were saying quite a lot that you don't worry about it, you don't worry about it and you think they worry too much. The practitioner, the practitioner is now starting to set goals with Joe in trying to find an overlap between Joe's chosen goals and what the service can provide. What are the things that you like to be different? I would just like to get thinner, I'd like to lose like half a stone and feel more confident about myself. Yeah, like without, yeah, without, without mum dad worrying, my mum and dad worrying about me right. so much. I don't, right. I don't think there's anything wrong with me. And you say that you might, and want, you say that you might want to half lose stone, half a stone, stone and that you'd feel more confident. Confident, confident. confident. right? Okay. And what, that and what would that? that be, what would that be like when you feel more confident? What would you be doing differently from how you feel now? I don't know. Maybe have like more friends. Just generally be more happy, I suppose. Okay. Yeah. So feeling more confident, yeah. so feeling more confident having more friends and just feeling happier than you do now. Okay. Because okay. one of the things that would be really helpful would be for us to agree on something that we can work together on. Uh, now, I uh, now, I know that you said that you think that mum and dad are worrying too much, uh, but we were saying a little bit earlier that your weight is already low and we can't let it get any lower than that. And for you, you say that what you, your goal is, is to lose more weight. But what you'd also like, if you lose more weight, is to feel more confident and to have more friends and to feel happier. Yeah. What I was wondering is whether the feeling more confident, having more friends and feeling happier 
might be the bit where we can do something, do something together on. Because for you, because for you, you, you think if you lose more weight, that's the thing that make you really happy. I'd like you to be happy. I'd like you to be happy, and I'd like you to be more confident and have more friends as well. And that's what mum and dad were saying earlier that they feel you. I've changed quite a lot. I've changed quite a lot from how you used to be. You're not seeing your friends quite so much. So what what I can't do is I can't work with you on losing more weight because we've got to we've got to safety is the top priority as we said right at the beginning and it's not safe for you to lose more weight. But I don't feel skinny. I feel that I think everyone looks at me and they feel think I'm fat, but they just say that I'm skinny just because to make me feel better or something. Yeah. So, if we could find so if we could find something about keeping you safe and helping you to feel more confident with your friends and have more friends and feel happier, if we could do that, is that something that we you'd be well happy might be pushing it but feel all right to 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 work on? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think so. Okay. You wouldn't always expect, you wouldn't to, reach always expect to reach this point with a teenager in just one it session. May well it may well be that more work would need to be done before be these goals can be Perhaps set. Several Perhaps several more sessions. However, in order to illustrate, However, in order to illustrate the next phase in working with we'll goals, we'll now move on to writing and scoring the goals on paper. So, if we were to have a go at writing those down in some way, so um, one of the things was to more confident. Feel more confident. Okay, so if we just pause that there, and then if you'd like to again, if you're in a workshop uh, or a seminar, uh, take a little bit of time to think about how did you find that process of setting goals, uh, and and how do you think the idea of setting goals? I mean, the work. I think from a counseling perspective probably the work is quite therapist led there but maybe focus more on this question about how do you feel about the idea of young people setting their own goals and then rating their goals rather than using more standardized measures of the one we've seen what, what do you see as the kind of strengths and limitations of that and again if you want to pause me now So, I just wanted to go and say something. There's another kind of slightly different measure, which is, I think, very helpful. It's a bit like, it's not un dissimilar from a kind of extended version of the friends and family test, if you know, from NHS about, would you recommend this service to your friends and family? But it's called the ESQ or the Chai ESQ, uh, the Experience of Service Questionnaire. It's for young people, 12 to 18. And it's a, essentially a satisfaction with service measure that can be this. This you would use at the end of uh, counselling, rather than uh, at the end of an intervention, rather than uh, on a, on a regular basis. You could use it kind of part way through, uh, I guess, and then you know, kind of review for or something. And it basically asks young people how they found the service. Uh, did they feel listened to? Did they would they recommend it? Was the help was the help good? It's a nice balance actually to a uh, symptom measure things like YP core and we found in some of our research that actually the association with them is, is is there is one but it's not actually that high because as we know things like symptoms can be so affected by young people um, by um, external circumstances and things happen at school or, or problems in the family so symptom trackers can pick up more of those kind of everyday things and if you really want to know how the young people experience the, the the therapy was it helpful or not then something like a satisfaction measure can be very useful although you have to be a bit cautious with these because clients typically are very very positive so um you know if you get lots of uh high scores it's not uh unusual i remember john mcleod telling me once that kind of 95 percent satisfaction was the norm if you got the less than 95% you needed to worry, which I think is probably a little bit strong. 
But yeah, with something like this, experience the service questionnaire, you, you'd be expecting 80, 90% of fairly um, satisfying. There's also, what's nice is that there's open-ended questions. So you get a sense, not just of how helpful, but maybe what was helpful. Now, just in terms of scoring individual clients, how you score all these measures. Um, all of these measures, I think if you if you Google them, you can find them pretty easily on the internet. And what you'll find is nearly always scoring procedures along with them. They're all pretty straightforward. Uh, for instance, a young person's call, you've got scores on each individual item, you just add it up. It gets a little bit more complicated if you've got missing scores and there's different things you can do about that. And that's where scoring keys can be quite helpful. Sometimes the items are reversed, so like like a score to the right is it should be a high on some items and then on other it's a zero rather than four so sometimes again a scoring key can be useful uh but but it's fairly straightforward a number of the measures like the sdq the young person's core i think the arcads have kind of benchmarks of what's clinical non-clinical ranges and those can be useful both at the individual level i guess to say well look, this seems to be in the clinical range meaning that it's kind of within the distribution of people who are experiencing more severe psychological problems. Uh, and then you can look at whether there's what's called clinical change, somebody moving from the clinical range to the non-clinical range. Um, and it can also, at a, at a kind of population level, help you understand more about the samples in a particular service, about how it compares, say, with people in other services. There's clinical change, whether you move from clinical band to a non-clinical band. There's also what's called reliable change, which is, like, if you think with those measures, there's always going to be certain vagaries in how people score it week to week. So reliable change is, say, change more than five points, which is, again, you have to look at the different measures to find out what's reliable change, uh, the reliable change index. But it, it, it tells you that the change was enough to not be due to the kind of vagaries and the random variation in the measure. So you have clinical change, which is from clinical to non-clinical. You have reliable change, which is a certain amount of change. And then you can have a whole combination of different things that people might report. Like you can have, sometimes you look at how many people showed uh, clinical change, how many people showed reliable change, how many people showed clinical and reliable change, which is ideally what you want, that somebody has come both from clinical to non-clinical but also at an amount that suggests that it's not just random and then you've also got deterioration so somebody could show clinical deterioration which is go from a non-clinical range to a clinical range or uh, reliable deterioration which is where they deteriorate by a certain amount of points so there's various combinations a very simple report you might just report the average at the beginning and the average at the end and the amount of uh, uh, maybe young people or children that move from uh, clinical to non-clinical and non-clinical to clinical. Just bear in mind, if you're doing uh, reports, that um, a key metric is how much, uh, what percentage of uh, responses you've got of the people who use the service. And that goes back to the thing about doing it weekly. It's one thing to say, well, we saw that the average went from, say, 18 on the YP core to 12, uh, and that was out of 10% of the people who used the service versus saying that was out of 90% of the people. The, the latter is so much more robust. If you've only got data from 10%, less than 50%, it's hard to really interpret that because often the missing scores are from the ones who didn't do so well. And I think commissioners, funders are, are more savvy about these kind of things now and, and want to see data from everyone. Most of the calculations can be done on uh, some fairly simple software. Excel uh, sometimes needs some setting up, but it's normally fairly easy to do that on that. Um, as I was saying, there is more specialised software, things like Pragmatic Tracker, uh, but you do have to pay for them, uh, and, and, and some are more expensive than others. Uh, as I was saying, the simplest is just to compare the means at the start against the means at the end. Uh, then you can look at something called, is the change significant? So is it more than just random variations? Also, how big is it? Effect sizes. You might need to look, read a bit about what's called an effect size or Cohen's D. And that's the kind of magnitude of change from beginning uh, to end. Ideally, in school counselling services, we see somewhere between about 0.5 and 0.8 of an effect size, uh, Cohen's D. So if you work out it, it, what it is for you, then you'll see probably something between about 0.5, maybe 0.5 and 1. 
You can also look at the proportion of clients show reliable and clinical change. I think in terms of clinical change, it's less than with adults. It's about 30, 40%. And CAMS, if you look at the CAMS data, and you can find that, I think, on the court website, you'll find the CAMS data, and you can, again, benchmark it against CAMS services if you're working at a service level. Just in terms of some principles of good practice, so as I was saying before, Use measures that have got established reliability and validity. Um, uh, it, it is important in terms of communicating with others and being able to be part of a kind of field that's growing and developing evidence and understanding these things. There's so many measures out there, and, um, and, and, and if people, everybody uses their own measure, it becomes very hard to find a common language. Generally, outcome measures would be used at the start of sessions, uh, and you can ask somebody to fill them in before they come into the session, although bear in mind that they might then be looking at quite distressing things when you're not there. So personally, I prefer to do it just at the beginning and take a couple of minutes over it. Uh, I guess there's something about, just before this next point, I guess there's something about how many measures. You probably don't want something that is going, I mean, maybe one or two measures uh, you don't want something which is going to go on more than, say, five minutes or so. Uh, but sometimes a couple of measures is every week. Uh, young people tend to be okay with that. Um, integrate them, as I was saying before. Integrate it into the therapy. So don't just give somebody a measure and then um, uh, um, uh, just get on with the therapy. But, you know, look at the results together. Look at what it's saying. See if there's anything interesting there. Is there anything the young person or child wants to discuss on that? Use it to inform supervision. For instance, if you've got a child or young person where the schools are getting worse, that, that's a pretty good indicator that, that it, it's worth taking some of that supervision and looking at what's happening. As I was saying before, you know, do you think about using them on a weekly, weekly basis? I know that can seem a lot, but once you start doing that and you get fairly used to it, it's, it, it just becomes part of the routine, like the ritual of therapy. Your client comes in, how you doing? Here's a form, here's, here's our form. Do you want to have a, spend a couple of minutes on that? Or they might do it in the waiting room. And uh, yeah, it just becomes part of the therapy. Um, yeah, 11 plus self-report, uh, younger than 11 parent teacher. Uh, and if you're going to do it for service evaluation, do kind of work out what you're going to do with the data. We hear so many stories about people, kind of these big piles of data just sitting there because people have collected all this data, but have never worked out how they're going to do it. Data entry, particularly if you're doing it manually, does take some time. Someone's got to put all the numbers into uh, to Excel or however you're going to do it. So uh, you need to work out who's going to do that. Is it going to be an administrator or a counsellor? But you know, do that before you start collecting data because the last thing you want to do is collect loads of data, uh, involve your practitioners in it, involve your uh, the clients in it, and then actually end up never doing anything with it. Now, there's some really good sessions. If you go to Counselling Minded, um, there's some very good sessions on using outcome measures. If you go to minded.org.uk and then um, you can go to the catalogue counselling minded and then there's these sessions on using outcome measures as well as monitoring change which can be useful to look at. And if you want to, as a, as a workshop, if you're doing this in a workshop, you might want to pause me now and go and have a look at that on Counseling Minded and work your way through as a group or in pairs through that session. There's also uh, a session on using the goal-based outcome tools on Counseling Minded. And again, that might be something that you want to uh, have a work through. Each of these sessions probably take about 20 to 30 minutes or so. Okay. Let me say just a bit about process measures as well. So what I'd like you to do is that you should have the client uh, session rating scale there. And if you'd like to take just a few minutes to fill it in and then discuss with a partner. So this is something you do at the end of a session. A young person might do at the end of a session or a child. Um, what do you think that would be like for them? If you were a child, how would that be for you? If you haven't paused me already, pause me now. So the client rating session is, is partnered with the outcome rating scale we saw earlier. And it's, a, it's this one here. Um, and what it does is it asks the 
young person to rate on these four scales how they felt about the session. Did they feel listened to? Did they feel that what was talked about was important? Did they like what they did? Overall, um, how did they feel about it? And then what happens is the young person rates it and then you add up the total. I think if it's less than 36, each is 0 to 10, if it's less than 36, because everybody tends to score it quite positively, then what you would do is you would have a conversation with a young person about how they're finding the counselling, um, what, what, what's the reason why, <laughs> not, not, not in a kind of, what's your reason, but just in a general way about, you know, is there anything that would be useful to know about why, um, what is it, what, what's maybe not working for you here? And that can be very useful, I think, in bringing up issues and helping young people talk about things that maybe are more difficult to talk about. Um, so it kind of is assessing the client's experience of the alliance in the session. Um, oh, am I going backwards? Sorry, I'm going backwards in the slides. So just in terms of using that that, that session rating scale, um, it's very important that you say to clients that you welcome negative feedback, that if there's anything they don't like, please tell me about it, uh, that you're not going to be offended, and, and it's obviously important not to be defensive. Again, it, although this is used towards the end and you don't want to go too over time, integrating the measure completion into therapy, talking about it with clients is really important can be really helpful in supervision, uh, especially where clients are rating the alliance quite low uh, as a way of thinking about where clients are and uh, how the work uh, can be done in a more constructive way. And also, of course, recognising where clients are really happy with the work and, and kind of my experience of using the measures is often it's very reassuring to know that clients seem okay with it. And of course, same thing, clients don't always say what they feel and if they know particularly if they're kind of filling it in handing it to you uh they may be more cagey um but um uh, my experience is is that clients are more honest on the forms than they are to my face it kind of again gives a bit of a third space if you think about going to a restaurant and the waiter comes up to you and says how was the food <laughs> it can be really difficult to say oh i'm terrible at it very english uh, you know however awful it is i'll just say oh yes lovely uh, partly because I don't want to make things awkward, which I'm sure is also true for clients. But if you give me an evaluation form, <laughs> I can get away before anyone's looked at it. I don't suppose that's what I mean. That's not the same as therapy. But yeah, even if it was an evaluation form and I was giving it back to the waiter, I'd find it easier to be a bit more critical. Not massively, but a little bit. Um, on counseling minded, there's another very good session on uh, process measures with some demonstrations again. So if you'd like to have a look at that, if you're doing this as part of a workshop, then do have a look at that now and pause me now. Okay, just the last thing I want to say is about just standardising demographics. There's a very useful form called Current View. Again, you can get it from the Cork website. I think Cork developed it. And it's a kind of standardised demographic. Uh, actually, it's not demographic. It, it, it's kind of... Problem descriptions, complexity factors, and contextual problems, um, as well as that you would use alongside kind of standard demographics that you would, you, you would, you know, like sex, gender, uh, age, and those interesting discussions about whether you would be doing that, I guess, ethnicity. Um, but perhaps monitoring who's using the service might, might be a, a reason to do that. Uh, and then and then current view allows you to capture some of the complexity factors like for instance refugee learning disabilities and also some of the issues and you use that as a beginning when a client comes in that's completed by the counselor rather than the client but it's a good way and again it's kind of standardized way of keeping track. I, guess, I guess you're in the frustration of someone who's worked 20 years in the field with everyone using different things and if we could all use the same measures we could know who's going to school counseling who's going into cams voluntary sector and we could bring things a bit more into a common language so that's pretty much it just to say again you know do have a look at the court website and have a look at counseling minded but it's, it's, a, it's a fantastic website it's all very free and accessible to use uh, and gives you a lot more things around uh, including downloading a lot of the measures that I've been talking about uh, for all things process and outcome so uh, really do have a look at that as a kind of next step 
And there's some lovely videos there by young people themselves talking about their experiences of outcome measures. And I think that is it. So thank you very much. I hope that's helpful.